Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za. It's just gone three after 11. Uh, we apologize for that late start, but you're listening to The Weekly with me, Sam Marshall, and every week we have a chat to authors, interesting people, people that are changing our uh, social landscape, people that are maybe around the dinner table forcing us to have some serious, serious conversations. And um, this week I read a book that I think is one of those books that um, you have to pass it on to your partner. I think there are a couple of things that... Um, the author raises in a credible way that really does maybe to a certain degree if you're open to it changes the dynamics and the journey and the trajectory in terms of where you thought you're heading and I think uh, nobody articulates it and describes it better in her book than Kathy Mann and the book is called Avoiding Burnout the seven principles of self-preservation and you could be easily mistaken for it being a self-help book but there's some real lived examples of somebody who looked to have the life she was in charge she was in control she was super fit she was an amazing mom she was an amazing partner she was trying to be an amazing daughter she was trying to be the peacemaker everything in her life and then it all comes crashing down. But I don't want to take the words away from her. Kathy, <laughs> good morning. Thank you very much for joining me on The Weekly. Thanks, Sam. It's great to be here. Kathy, you know what? You, you, you write the kind of book, and I, and I'm, and I, must, I must declare this um, at the beginning. Um, I generally don't read books to the end because in the past, in my early days as a journalist, I used to spoil it for people, and they didn't want to buy it afterwards. <laughs> this one I read all the way to the end. Oh, good. Um, but I'm not going to spoil it. So I want <laughs> us to kind of stay away from the main talking points so that there is a reason for people to buy it. But your journey... And this journey of self-discovery and self-awareness and this journey of identifying the role and where you fit into things and where you would like people to fit into things, that didn't come easy. No, it was a difficult journey, I must say. But I think sometimes uh, you get to a better place from uh, times of struggle and suffering than if you know, compared to when life was smooth sailing. Mm. Your, your story starts out quite weird, and I, I don't mean weird in the weird <laughs> way. Here is a perfect family in many ways. I'm loving parents. Um, uh, you had a great relationship with your brother. And then it, 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 it goes completely off the rails. <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> so talk to me a little bit about, about just deciding to put this book together. And we'll get into the nitty gritties a little bit. Uh, more we've got a, we've got about 50 minutes together but but I just want to get the headspace because you needed to be in a certain space in order to be this frank about the role that Stuart played in the yes. early days you needed to be honest with yourself about your relationship with your mom and your and 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 your dad and the other siblings and the step siblings and Judy and so mm -hmm. when when did you get to a point where you were just honest with yourself and you could be honest in putting what happened to you on paper and not try and protect people like Stuart um, in yeah. the beginning. Because, I mean, in the end, you have this beautiful relationship with your husband, but yeah. there are more moments in the book that you're, you're frank and you're open, he wasn't there. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting that you say that because I did rewrite uh, the first half of the book. I wrote it at first as a method for me to understand how I became so ill because I didn't. I saw everyone around me being quite stressed and how come it happened to me. So the writing was also almost a method of cathartic uh, discovery of how, how this happened to my life. And then I decided to rewrite it because I realized that I wasn't uh, totally truthful. I did leave out a whole lot of parts in the first version in order to protect my husband and to protect my mother. But I decided that in order to live this path of being truly authentic, um, I have to be honest with myself and with everyone else. And I think in doing that, it almost gives everybody else permission to be honest about what's not working in their lives. And honesty, in many ways, Kathy, means that you've got to be also truthful about your emotions. So that realization that you said you, you rewrote the book the first time, rewrote it the second time because you wanted to be truth, more truthful. What was the emotions that was going through you? Were you, were, were you because you got to a point where 
now towards the end, if you read these seven principles, you come to this idea that you've almost in many ways made peace with your place in the world and yes. with where people fit in your life. And yes. part of that has got to be an honesty. But what was the emotions like the moment you decided that, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to protect my mom. I'm not going to protect Stuart. I'm not going to protect Clyde. Um, yes. wh what was that emotions like? Were, were you nervous? Were, <laughs> yeah. Was there anxiousness? Was there... Yeah, I think that the, I, I felt that moment. I think many, many nonfiction writers feel this, that you, you put your story down and, and it gets published and then you, you grab the hold of this book and you realize it's going out into the world and you have this instant moment of fear, almost as if you want to now change your mind and pull it back. Mm. But there's no, there's no um, going back after you've got to that point. So I did have that fear and anxiety, but I also felt quite a sense of courage. I phoned my mother uh, before I published it to explain to her I've written about some of these really heartbreaking moments in our childhood and I've been honest about it. So, you know, that made a bit of a rift for us for about six weeks or so and then eventually she came around and, and she realized. But I think, I think the overarching thought I had at that time was this is my story. It's not their mm. story, it's my story. And I'm owning it and this is how I experienced it. Maybe they experienced something slightly different and they had different views on, on the experiences we had. But it is my story, and I'm owning it, and I'm putting it out there in the world. Your, your sense of contribution to things, um, and they always say that hindsight is a, an exact science, but the contribution, and, and, and I, I just want you to fr reflect for me, because I, I, I remember reading it, and I thought, oh, okay, what is this lady complaining about? They they had a perfect life and and the, the father was was ingenious in, in many ways he was able to craft a business everything went really well for that first section and then little things started started happening but where do you think that the very first contribution came to to the to where you eventually find yourself where you couldn't work you couldn't function you you had to you were misdiagnosed there was just so much stuff that were going on but what was now thinking back what was the very first point in your life that made the very first contribution to where you eventually found yourself I think it was the, the realization that my health is forever affected. I think, uh, you know, you carry on through life thinking, well, you know, I'm having a rough week or I'm feeling a bit mm. tired and you just keep pushing. But I think when I got that diagnosis, it's almost if everything turned for me to realize, well, actually, if I don't own my life and if I don't take charge and make these changes, no one's going to do it for me. And it's my health. I have to. I have to take that on. There's no um, blaming anybody else for what's going on in my own body and mind. Why did it? And, and maybe it's an unfair question because I think you 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 got the sense with the help of very a lot of people, and you started educating yourself. And I think when one starts reading and 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 being willing to educate oneself, you open up. A, a, a world of possibilities. Yeah, Pandora's and, box. Sometimes. Yes, and you and you read and you've read a lot since then. Yeah. Um, but but why do you think? What was it? You you had a, a father who was very loving, yeah. in the early stages of your life, up to the the age of thirteen. You had yes. a father a father that was av available to you emotionally, yeah. but you had a mom who was stoic and was unavailable. Yeah. And and where do you think those the the fact that they were so completely opposite to each other in mm -hmm. in the relationship to you. What do you think it, it added to your personality? Because you describe in the, the sense that I get to the book that you felt alone a lot of the time. Yes, I did. I think I felt very much like my, my mother, I think, imparted a lot of good things. And she mm. did her best to try to parent me well. So she taught me things like consideration for others and manners and all of that. Mm. And uh, it's interesting how sometimes as a child we almost take on this understanding of, well, I'm not important because everybody else seems to have this great importance that my mother's mm. putting on that. And it's you talk very, about that in the book too. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting because I don't think that was her intention. She didn't want to make me feel like I didn't matter. But through her parenting, that's what I, I ingested almost. Mm. And uh, I think I felt as if very much like I wasn't seen to be the person I was. I wasn't cherished and... Um, mm. You know, love, I wasn't kind of given the outward show of love that I really craved as a child. So where did the bravery come from? <laughs> because, y you know, there, there's this, this period um, after things fall apart in your house. Your father's now moved on. Yeah. Um, and there is this resolve in you that 
I think it is I forgot his name now, but it's the it's Graham. Graham, right. the mm. the guy before your mother got married. Yeah. To to the I, I assume she's still married to that guy. No, not anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> but there was a guy that she was serious about that broke her nose. Yes. Yes. And um and and there's a bravery. Where did that bravery sure. come from? Because because up to that point you don't you don't you don't talk about bravery. You don't yeah. I mean your you and your father had a great positive attitude and he was always always saw the you know uh, um, it was always willing to see that there w- there would be a tomorrow. Your mom was a pessimist. Yeah. Um, but where does the bravery come from? Because it doesn't seem to be sitting in both of them. Yeah, I'm not sure where that came from. It was a bit of a surprise to me at the time. But I do write about a, a moment where we my mom ran over the dog and we were kids. Yes. And I almost... As you got out to put the puppy down. Yes. No. I almost kicked into gear and took charge of that situation as I was younger than 13 then. I was mm. quite a young child. So I sort of almost knew that there was something in me that could really take charge of a situation in, in a time of crisis. And perhaps all the times of feeling alone... Um, made me a bit stronger. I realized I had to mm. own, I had to take ownership of my own life and take charge of things because nobody was there for me. So mm. almost in a way that could be a gift that, that I found that courage to sort out my family when no one else had the strength to do that. But, there, but there's also something scary that you say in the book is that when, you're, when your parents eventually um, started becoming acting like children and, and their relationship disintegrated completely, you made you made the decision that you would have to parent them yeah and for me when a child gets to to that decision and and you had to forego your teenage years yeah what what was Kathy like after 13 having to then become um not the peacemaker but mm. but i think also for me that that's really telling of who you eventually became because the decision then to be mm. the parent or parent the situation yeah. to then deal with a father who had an alcoholic problem, mm. was a charmer, was a really great guy, and with a mom left in this different position, was then going through her own trauma, mm. and you were then kind of there trying to navigate your space and your brother's space. Yeah. What did that do to you? Because it, it definitely affected you in your later years. Yeah, I think so. I, I think we have these moments of great courage where we step up and we protect our family and we do what needs to be done in that moment. But I do believe there is a cost. I think there is a, is a longer cost because it was, in, in fact, a trauma. And there was in those days, it wasn't really common to experience counseling and, and go mm. for those things. So you, you must absorb that, that cost in, internally. And I think along that process, then I started to, you know, my health probably started to deteriorate. Mm. I have found quite a lot of interesting research that shows how childhood trauma affects your ability to maintain cortisol stress hormone in your body. So almost when you have very, uh, as, as a child, if you have a lot of trauma, your body doesn't self-regulate. It doesn't learn to bring down the cortisol after sure. the stress event. So I think a lot of the, those experiences really raised my levels of stress. I was almost on high alert for most of my life, mm. which isn't a great way to operate. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about operating at, 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 such a, at such a stressful level your entire life, you have found mechanisms to cope. Yeah. And I think we do it every day. Um, and, yeah. and we do it sometimes, especially if we're very active and you're, you yeah. are or still are or you were. I'm not running anymore. No. Okay, okay. You didn't. <laughs> but I love exercise. I need exercise. For sure. Yeah. Because there was advice that was given to you to stop it at yes. some point. Yes. Um, but when you operate like that, things that are not normal become normal. Yeah. Be- before you, that moment you decided to go and get the diagnosis because you were living a very stressful life up, up to that point. But what were some of the things that you made normal in your head that now, upon reflection, was not normal? Yeah, I think uh, I think the running maybe was a little extreme, yeah. <laughs> and I know there are many people in the in, you know, especially but in our country, we still our, do it. Yeah, people push themselves. I mean, training for things like triathlons and that—that's pretty intense. And even comrades training is really tough. You really mm. push yourself. And uh, I remember people saying to me. Wow, um, you're like Superwoman. How do you manage it all? And was that a compliment to you when you heard that? Wow, you're like Superwoman? At the time. And now I look back and I think, okay, well, clearly that wasn't sustainable. <laughs> mm, for sure. Yeah, I was pushing myself physically. And also, you know, I didn't really stop to realize, well, without adequate sleep, being under this kind of stress, I'm not really doing myself any favors by running. But I thought, oh, you know, I'm stress busting. 
I'm, I'm doing what everybody does. And we'll talk about sleep and some of the, the other remedies you've discovered through self-education, but also yeah. some great friendships that you've developed because of this. Um, and we'll talk about that in the in, in the latter part of this conversation. But for now, I still want to focus on that first half of the book because I'm I'm I am pleasantly surprised when I started off and I thought, well, this is quite an interesting little read. The, you know, this is where this this person finds herself. And I want to talk about motherhood because that is something that we don't often talk about. It comes if you are already depleted as a human being running as you for as you call yourself superwoman you're now entering into a completely different space and yeah. there it's manic yes. but but you then decide your father then clyde then says to you he, he's kind of niggling at it mm. join the family business join the family business yeah. you you had this moment in your career and for me already when you were at the bank that was already a marker that things were were, were happening yes yet again hindsight it, it was is a great great thing but did you think that at the time that you made that decision to join the family business that it would be easier i did i thought oh it's going to be quite uh, relaxed because i can navigate my own hours the traffic and was you less. say that in the book actually mm, I, I expected i did spend less time in traffic but i didn't anticipate the stress of becoming a business owner i hate leanne <laughs> i hate her <laughs> Yes. Gee was if I met yeah. a Leanne, I would, yeah. if this was a movie, I would orchestrate something. I'd be like the mafia, <laughs> plant a bomb or something. I tried my best. I really did. I tried so hard. And is that, we? and, and you know, and this is funny because <laughs> at the end of the book, you talk about Leanne. Yeah. Um, what was, what was in you? I mean, how does somebody who runs marathons, um, trains that hard? Because it takes a different resolve. I always tell my friends that, you know, Hey, by the way, it's not easy to run. No. It takes a different kind of person to put on shoes, especially when everybody is still awake, mm -hmm. uh, well, still asleep in the morning, to get into all kinds of conditions and run. Yeah. Why could you not approach the Leans of the world, the Peters of the world, the same way you approached running, the same tenacity? Yeah, I think, I think it's part of my childhood and my character. So my personality, I'm a people pleaser. I like to make people happy. I want to be liked. And that stopped me a lot. And, and it prevented me from being a good leader, in fact. A good leader tackles the tough conversations. And I wasn't a good leader. I didn't, I didn't have those conversations with her. I didn't address her mm -hmm. behavior in a, in a constructive way. I think, in a way, I wasn't equipped. So I didn't really know what to do. Mm. And that's a pity because looking back now, you know, if I own a business again, I'll be really uh, on top of a bad apple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're listening to The Weekly with me, Sam Marshall. Uh, I've got uh, Kathy Mann in studio with me. She wrote a book, Avoiding Burnout, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. We're about to take an ad break. When we get back, we'll move this conversation along. There's so much to unpack in this book without trying to spoil it for you. We'll take an ad break. We'll be back after this. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastalmedia.co.za Hi hey, Bonang, how are you? Hi Tuli, you look so beautiful, hey, long time no see. What happened to your skin, by the way? The last time I saw you, you had a lot of blemishes and breakouts. It was so terrible, man. Wow, thanks for that, Bonang. Luckily, I discovered DMK. Have you heard of DMK? DMK? Who are they? DMK is a paramedical skincare brand that specializes in all skin conditions. Would you like their number? Yes, please. I know you're not good at numbers, so let me give you their website address because your skin looks terrible. It's www.dmkskincare.co.za whether you're an athlete or just going about your day-to-day -day business, use TurboFreeze on the go for any pain relief or inflammation. It's the number one pain relief formula. To find out more, log on to our website, www.turbofreeze.co.za. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. 
Welcome back. You're listening to The Weekly with me, Sam Marshall. Uh, I've got Kathy Mann in studio. She's written a book called Avoiding Burnout, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. And I've got to tell you, it is a stellar read. I did start the show by saying that it's the kind of conversation you will have with your partner if you care. It's the kind of conversation that will uh, spark maybe a, a different way of looking at your life. And I think there's maybe something interesting that um, that Kathy mentions towards the end of the book on how we frame success. And I think the way we frame success comes comes tied comes tied directly to these words. Um, the harder the the harder you work, the more successful you become. Do you agree, Kathy? We've all heard it. I've heard it. No, I don't agree anymore. And through my own experience, plus the research I did when I was sick, I've I've realized that there's a lot of research studies showing that, in fact, success follows happiness and not the other way around. And that was quite a groundbreaking moment for me because I realized I've been chasing success and I should actually be chasing happiness. For sure. Mm. Um, You know, during the break, we talked about there's, there's always a Leanne. So there has to be a villain or something. Yeah, at least and one. and uh, we'll we'll move on to the seven principles of self preservation. But for me, and 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 you know, it's such a weird thing because you were people please at work. How did that translate into your marriage with Stuart? Because you you talk so beautifully about. Eventually, you started reading your blogs when yeah. you created the blog, and there was insight and. There were different things. And so, so maybe if you weren't so, so much of a people pleaser, you could have had a much better, much better support system at the beginning. That's right. I think, uh, you know, I can't blame Stuart for, for the for things sure. that happened. There's no question that it was my doing. I got myself exactly into that situation all by myself. But um, I do did realize along the way that I wasn't good at asking for help. Mm. I wasn't clear. I expected, you know, my spouse to mind read. And I think that's a quite a common thing. They, you know, can't can't they see that I'm battling? And and I wasn't showing that. I was looking like the superwoman on the outside. So how was the poor guy to know? He, how can he uh, volunteer to help when I'm not even asking? For sure. Talk to me about becoming a mom because it was all these other stressful things happening in your life. You were building a very successful career. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that jumped out at me is that you, you amassed enough to be able to, when you had downtime, you'd be able to live over it which says to me that you were very good at what you did. Yeah. But then you bring in motherhood, which comes with its, its I mean, if you've never been a mom, it's the most difficult things, thing yeah. to describe. And, and just talk to me about that dynamic, because you're already dealing with the duties of the world and, yeah. and your mom and your dad and, and her new husband and there's yeah. stepbrothers, there's business <laughs> issues, there things are not working out um, when you were at the bank um, when you because you left there for a reason and so now you now you are mom yeah I think it created great strain and it, that was a shock to me everybody talks about these great joys of motherhood and how wonderful and you'll be all enamored with this little person and of course you are but mm. nobody really talks about the level of strain that you're going to have to endure for the next couple of years of your life you know just the sleep deprivation alone is a pretty remarkable thing Mm. Um, not only that, but trying to be the person who keeps another person alive. A mm. level of responsibility. And you had some huge. tough calls with your little one. Yeah. There were, there, were some, there were some harrowing moments. Yeah, we were in hospital on Christmas and things. Yeah, we had some, some really tough times initially. But uh, now I look at them and look how beautiful they are. They've, uh, they've mm. turned out great. <laughs> and you know, me. And <laughs> <laughs> um, m- m- most people say it's because of you. When you are... A people pleaser you struggle to ask for help yeah. you're a new mother there is a little bit of self-diagnosis when it comes to a bit of postnatal depression yeah. there's so much going on how do you find the strength then and you describe it um i'm quite clearly just the effort of engaging with people just the effort of mm. getting up just the effort of of having focus yeah, it was pretty grueling. At that time when I was really approaching burnout, it was it took an unbelievable amount of willpower to get out of bed in the morning, to take my children to school. And, you know, when they're little, you know, you're brushing a couple of other sets of teeth in the morning and, sure. and then don't, don't really do what you say. They're all over the place. And so it's very difficult to maintain that. Um, so that was very, very difficult for me to, to cope with. 
And uh, yeah, looking back, it's no wonder. I think most most mothers of young children are taking tremendous strain and uh, you know that was that's one of my reasons for writing this book I want people to see how hard it is and for people to learn to ask their partner in particular for support yeah and 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 there's a call from you in the book to um, partners to be a, a lot more active but you know what was scary for me and I don't know if you were just that good at lying um nobody around you noticed that you were um heading to this cliff yeah. that you were getting closer and closer um and you and you bemoan the fact that your your father didn't notice and you bemoan the fact that that your husband didn't notice friends family didn't notice what were you doing right that they didn't notice well i wouldn't say that that's the right thing to do oh, what I, was wrong yeah, what were you doing I, wrong i think I, tr- i was trying to hold it all together i think i had this understanding of well i'm a capable person and i should be able to handle this i should be able to handle the stress of motherhood plus running a business uh, you know uh, everybody else in the and world and who put that on you Kathy who told you that you were meant to handle all of that I did. when motherhood I, is one of the most difficult things in the world i put it on myself completely so i wasn't letting people see and that i think you know i talk about um, my um, psychotherapist to help me mm. deal with a lot of the things and she, one of the things she told me is let people see how much you're struggling just stop wearing makeup when she said that know? word to you what were you, what were what what hit <laughs> you because you you talk about just the word psychotherapy is a big word mm, yeah i think i i freaked out a little bit at that because it was my my pattern and my habit to hold it all together to look like this capable person if people thought i was superwoman i didn't want them to see that i wasn't and mm. that i wasn't coping it's it's kind of embarrassing to show the world that you're not coping mm. so i didn't want to um, drop the ball but I should have dropped quite a few just to let people see that I really needed help. And you know you asked me about um you know how I was holding it all together and I I wasn't you know letting people see that. I actually didn't know that stress would cause that level of illness. Uh, you, you, we were always told you people get sick when they've got a bad diet or when they don't exercise. I was doing all the things right except for stress. Mm. And that I didn't see coming. I had no idea that stress could actually give you a lifelong illness language when you when you talk like this and, I, and the words like psychotherapy jump out at me and there are language around stress and other stuff how did your vocabulary change because you were being introduced to something completely different something like you said you were you were not aware that stress could get to a level that could give you a, a lifelong illness how did your vocabulary change i think i started to really articulate better what i needed and and i started to use i but more things like um i need some rest and you know as i've said i spoke to my husband about it. this is what i need i needed started to talking about me instead of trying to tackle everybody else mm. um so that i think changed quite a lot and uh, i started to also think about and practice all the things that i'd read in positive psychology so i started to talk in terms of what leads to happiness mm. how can i find more joy and those are the kind of focus areas i started to work on we'll get into those seven principles i want to touch on one last thing F- for me now that you've been diagnosed you were misdiagnosed as well initially yeah. initially and then through the the brains of somebody smarter you were able to get the right diagnosis what what was happening as the obviously when you're that active when you're at the center of everything you become the nexus for everything what was happening to the universe while you were going through those things <laughs> i think things changed quite a lot uh, particularly in my immediate family so my husband really had to step up so he worked a full day at work and then he came home and he bathed the children he cooked the meals i didn't have the energy to get out of bed and to stand for the duration of cooking the meal mm. so that's the level of the fatigue so he had to really pick everything up which i think was quite tough on him mm. and almost the shock of having me this capable person that being so incapacitated was also quite a psychological mm. um shock for him because you're both runners yes mm. you're both highly active people yeah and we were both successful at work and mm. you know so it was a, it was quite a shock to him i think he had to grapple with what was going on with his partner and then also my my kids you know my children looked up to me and they would loved it that i was the boss of the organization and then i was nothing i was just mm. a sick person who lay in bed mm. so it was difficult for my kids to also understand you know what's going on here how has our whole universe collapsed 
And have you had conversations with them? I know they're very young. And it's very, and for them, it's more kind of tactile. It's more the the experience of things, and so it's very difficult to speak at a, a, a high level emotionally to young children. How were you able then to explain that mommy's in this space at this moment, and knowing that you're speaking to a child? Yeah, we we had a conversation, particularly with our oldest, our six year old at the time, and explaining to her that you know, mom's become sick from stress, and we discussed how that works, and it means that mom has to rest a lot. Um, and they accepted that. The the trouble with the little one, though, she was three. So when you have that kind of For conversation, sure. they forget about it. And 10 minutes later, they want you to be on the floor playing Lego. You know, so it was difficult. I had to keep reminding her, I need rest. I need rest. You know, it's just had to wing it. A bit. So you then, through all of this process, you then become self-aware of your, of your space. And you become self-aware that you need help and you go for the diagnosis and all of those kinds of things. Talk to me about the journey of discovery in terms of information and access to information and where that placed you, not only for, for yourself, but for a, a conduit be, for to become the conduit for better conversations within your family structure, yeah. better routines, getting your husband more active, who was was probably always willing, but you were a poor communica- yes. communicator, yes. being being more truthful and then as part of that discovery, the realization that Jake wasn't who you, you thought he was. Yeah, I think there were two main areas where I, I feel that I, I researched and was able to, to share knowledge, in particular in my space and with my friends and that. So the one was a lot about the, um, the medical journey knowing that you need to take on your own health and if you get a diagnosis that doesn't sit right, go and investigate more. And the world we live in at the moment is really um, information rich. There's so much online, the books and the resources, the newsletters. I just absorbed completely and then was able to um, impart that with others. The second area, I think, was in that field of happiness. So how do we how do we build happy lives and how do we have mindful conversations and that? So I think those are the two big areas where I spend a lot of time researching and understanding so that I can impart that with the people around me. Okay, time for another ad break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation. We'll look at the seven principles of self-preservation. We're not going through all of them. We want you to buy the books. So you can uh, have a read. But there's some interesting uh, first two principles that I think we need to delve in a little bit more. We'll also uh, talk a little bit more about confronting Jake. Um, The first time that Kathy wrote that letter to, um, I think it's Charles, where she had to admit that she needed help. And then also where writing fitted in into this, because it was through writing that your father understood um, the role he's playing. It's through writing that you resigned from that company it's through writing that you confronted Jake. So there was a writing has always been a critical part. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za. Making a bold statement yet blending into the surrounding suburbs of Melville, 27 Boxes is a realization of edgy design and practical implementation. A radical departure from the shopping malls of our generation, yet not a return to the high streets of our youth. 27 Boxes showcases the best of a shopping centre set in a garden, surrounded by the bohemian suburb that is Mulville. 27 Boxes. Shop. Play. Eat. This is what you missed on brandlife.co.za yeah for sure for sure yeah man and 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 and, and you know like the thing i was thinking about uh th- th- this conversation i uh, sort of like uh even simple things as a one is much cheaper now. like masturbation man do you think like a lot of homies do they talk about this type of thing <laughs> 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 so, like, even, mean, <laughs> like even the homies and the ladies live from 27 boxes in the heart of melville this is brandlive.co.za the unique experience living as one events presents relationship talks drama q a sessions music love stories ladies and gents session and lots more registration fee at 150 rand happening at bread of life foundation venue honey Jew shopping center bears nodier drive corner bloomberry drive unit 66 laser park honey Jew. 
Saturday, 15 September at 11 a.m. RSVP on 072-851-8702. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. Welcome back. You're listening to The Weekly with me, Sam Marshall. We've got our guest in studio. It's been a fascinating 40 minutes so far speaking to Kathy Mann, who is the author of Avoiding Burnout, The Seven Principles of Self-Preservation. In this book, she quite eloquently talks about her life and what led to uh, taking off, what, Kathy, nearly two years? It was three years recovery. Three years in total, yeah? Yeah, in total. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. How do you go from being somebody who's incredibly busy, jam-packed life, because you have, we eventually get into the, the steps of, of uh, seven principles of self-preservation, but one of them is to create a, a self-care roster. Yeah. How do you go from being so incredibly busy, running a business, growing the company uh, to 435% in profit, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then do nothing? It was very difficult, I must be honest. I, I grappled a lot with this, uh, you know, who am I and who am I supposed to be if I'm not doing things? Because I always closely linked my identity with my job title. So if I had no job title, what label, you know, what was mm. I? How did I define myself? And if I had no salary, was I worth anything? Mm. So that was a difficult place to be. And just the sheer boredom of hanging around at home. You know, you've got a high achiever sort of sitting around doing nothing. It, yeah. It's really, you can go absolutely out of your mind. And, and that's when I decided I wanted to read and learn. Yeah. If, if my life was so broken and I've got all this time on my hands, I'm going to apply myself and my time to fixing it. And, yeah. and that's why I started reading what I was reading, because at least I was growing and learning. W- was labels important to Kathy then? Was yes. it Was it important... For, for, for people not to know that you were a broken person and that you were going for psychotherapy and, and yes. all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, they were important in the beginning. And it took me some time to realize, well, I'm not the only one who's struggling with these issues. I'm yeah. not the only one who's finding motherhood hard and who's, who's struggling to juggle the demands of, of work and family. And along the way, you met some really interesting people. And you were able to rely on them too. But before I get there, I want to I talk about writing, and I talked about it as we segued way into the ad break. Writing is a critical part of your life now because you used it in critical moments when you didn't have the physical words. So, well, writing is physical too, but when yeah. you couldn't, it couldn't leave your body. You yes. had that moment with Clyde. Yes. Clyde teared up, but it, it, for a short while it changed. Judy didn't, wasn't involved in the, in the company for three weeks after that. Then mm-hmm. came back. You had it with uh, with Clyde, Charles, and then eventually Jake. Talk to me about the reading and and what reading has been able to do from an empowerment perspective. The, the writing. Yeah. Yeah. Writing. Sorry. I think writing has has always been something I wanted to do, and I, I look back at the goals I set even mm-hmm. as early as something like two thousand and three. I always wanted to write. And I dismissed it as, well, writing is a creative thing. It's just, uh, you know, it's kind of a mm. nice to have. It's not meaningful. It's not real work. Uh, but I have found that writing is a really important way that I've used to express my mm. strong emotions and uh, articulate things in a way where I couldn't find my voice. So I, I use those mechanisms to write down my thoughts fully. Um, and structure them in a way that I didn't get interrupted. I think because mm. I'm, I was quite a sort of a timid person at some points in my life, and the sicker I got, the less empowered I felt. So being able to write them down helped me to get that across at a time when I felt quite weak and depleted. Talk to me about your father, because uh, we talked about him a little bit earlier, but you haven't really made contact with your father, and it was... Uh, uh, and vice versa but there was a conversation where you said oh well I'll, I'll speak to you in a week or, or whatever yeah. and you haven't spoken to him since then yeah. how does how do you find peace with that it was at the time I had no intention of cutting him out of my life completely at the time I was just taking major strain and mm. he was nitpicking he was contributing to the stress at a time when I wanted a parent to be concerned for mm. my well-being um, so and he I, couldn't see it no and I pushed him further away thinking, well, I just need a bit of space. I just actually need to grapple with what's going on mm. with me right now. And I did intend to then make contact. 
but in within a couple of weeks i realized that my life's actually really calm mm. and pleasant without all the chaos that he brought to it and the more that happened the more i realized i actually do want the peace mm. and do i really want to introduce that kind of chaos back in and um, the answer is no still to this day and what was it was it did your father not see what did the lines become blurred did he not see Kathy the daughter or did he now see Kathy the managing director and what you've been what you were able to do with the business and all of those kind of things or or what happened what was it I think I think he saw me as a tool for financial gain um, at the end he most of his life he was able to earn a great deal of money but he, he was also very good at spending money mm. so he reached a point where he was kind of desperate and his actions and, and thoughts were all around well this is my mechanism to make more money so she, she, he, I felt almost like he was milking me to just gain his, his financial benefit and I had already sacrificed a great deal financially to be there even in the first place so when my health started collapsing what I wanted was a parent who was worried worried about me and who mm. wanted me to be well and not wanted me to be um, the conduit to more money. Mm. And and you know you, you you talk about your father and I and I and I for me it's also a very personal story because I also and I don't know I know know a lot of people that don't have issues with their father. <laughs> but your father says that if it wasn't for that first drink you might have, he would have never been in a relationship <laughs> with Judy. <laughs> and then you felt guilty and he kept on mm. staying and what what is your 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 life lessons taught you about consequence? I think uh, we need to uh, take accountability for the actions we take in our lives, and I, that's why I take full accountability for for getting burnout. It's not anybody else's fault. It's my sure. fault. But I think you know I see in my father the glaring opposite. Uh, he was very quick to be a victim and to blame others for the position he found himself in. And in funny and funny enough, your dad used different stories with different people. Yes, yes. And you came to that realization when Judy was smashing up the office. Yes, yes. And that was terrible for me because I realized, well, maybe he's been feeding her a whole lot of lies and she's just acting on what she's been told. And maybe, I mean, her behavior was never going to be acceptable. Mm. But um, you can kind of understand where she's coming from. She's also in a place of desperation and, and mm. fury. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I want to live in a life where I have honest relationships with people who value me and who mm. support me and build me up. So we're going to do a little catch up at the end of the show. I'll just wrap up their names and you can tell me <laughs> if they're active or not active. Um one of the first principles that you talk about is know yourself. Yes. And, well, actually, hold on. Before I get there, I want to talk about the word burnout itself. Because I have I Googled a little bit burnout, and there seems to be different reactions to the word burnout. And some people don't really see it as some medical thing. They think it's just you being tired at the end of the day. How has your understanding of that word burnout changed, and how were you able to then explain it? to people do not think it's well somebody just pretending to be lazy yeah i think the word burnout is is a difficult label because people do have a lot of these conceptions of well mm. it's a mental breakdown and you've completely lost control of yourself and um you know it's that that's embarrassing you had to be institutionalized and things so people have got these uh, notions of what it looks like um and i i do believe it's different for everybody and what strikes me so much is that uh, we mustn't separate the body and the mind so much. Mm. Uh, everybody, you know, we talk about mental health and physical health being so different. But in fact, the brain communicates with the rest of the body mm. uh, via hormones, and it's all part of one system. Mm. So when you're stressed, your, your brain is, is telling your body to react in a certain way to protect yourself, basically. So uh, it's for me, there were both aspects. You know, uh, in the mental space, I was having difficulty concentrating. I had depression. I had a lack, lack of motivation. And those were being caused by some of the hormones in my body. Mm. On the other side, the physiological side, then there's also, um, there was also the endocrine disruption. My endocrine system was struggling. Mm. You know, uh, cortisol levels were very mm. high. My thyroid function was... Um, collapsing and that you know came out in symptoms that were physical tremors heart palpitations sweating all of those un unpleasant things so it wasn't completely in my head i wasn't making it up and mm. I, I didn't g at one point i thought i was i thought i was having a midlife crisis and it's difficult to articulate to people who, who have always only known yes. high performance kathy 
Yes, and they people and they can't see it. You know, you don't have purple spots on your face when you're feeling <laughs> like this. But it's difficult yeah. to articulate just how tired you are and how and and something like fatigue and headaches. People don't really, um, you know, say, "Oh, get over it." Everyone's yeah. kind of tired, you know. We all have a niggle. Mm, yeah, just get up and get on with life and mm. sort yourself out. But in fact, my bod- body was collapsing and I couldn't I, I couldn't manage to work a full day. So that's the message I want to tell people. If you are feeling that way, um, it's real. It's not just imagined. It's not in your mind and it's maybe not a li- midlife crisis. Um, know yourself. It's yeah. one of the first principles yeah. uh, of the seven principles. Why was that listed as number one? I made it one on, uh, for a reason because I really believe that you cannot build a new foundation of, of a better life without truly knowing yourself. And we all have an idea that we know ourselves, but we often fail to align the rest of our lives with the person that we are. Mm. Things like our work, our values. If we align those and connect them all up, uh, we, mu- we tend to have a much happier life. We feel more authentic and mm. at ease than if we're working, say, in an organization that's contrary to our values. So build, that is the very foundation. You can't make effective changes in your life without knowing the person that you are. It does beg you to then be a little bit more honest with yourself and to go to a place that you were not willing to go to before, right? Yeah, I think you also have to, not only do you you accept and acknowledge your strengths, but also your weaknesses. I know that the the downside of being a people pleaser um, makes me uh, less likely to have difficult conversations. So that holds me back. Mm. But knowing that, then I can lean on people. And knowing where my weaknesses are, I can say in business, partner with people who are strong where I'm weak. Mm. And uh, I, I also believe, you know, being an introvert, I think many people feel like, oh, it's much more appealing to be fun. Mm. And introverts often don't aren't a whole lot of fun. And we have to make peace with that. Um, mm. And that is a conversation I'm having with my oldest daughter at the moment. My youngest is a bundle of fun. And my oldest has to grapple with the fact that that's not her. Mm. It's not authentic. And, 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 and I think the other thing that you're also talking to uh, from a subtext uh, perspective is that, when you are fun, people gravitate towards you and they kind of move away from the one that's slightly introvert and stuff. Yeah. And so you can see that in interactions, especially when the two of them are together. Yes, yes. So the young one actually leads all social interactions. The other one sort of um, falls into her slipstream. But there, uh, that's an interesting way to try and teach them that we all have our strengths and we need to appreciate the the benefits of each of those mm. introverts are also very good at looking for areas where there might be problems you know we mm. you know so uh, that those are real strengths in certain careers mm. they're more cautious and they you know often can avoid danger better how long did it take you and we're talking about the first principle how long did it take you to be authentic about your strengths and authentic about your labels because Sometimes those two things are exclusive of each other. And sometimes somebody might be great with their strengths and I'm this, I'm that, but they don't like to be labeled. Yeah, I think uh, labels and uh, job titles and that were very important to me before I I became ill. But somewhere along the journey of of recovering, I'd say probably in the second year of recovering, I started to really accept, well, I am who I am and I'm still of value even if I'm not working. Mm. I still have something to offer the world, even if I'm not making um, money. So that it took some, some work, some internal work, and a lot of thinking and uh, working on myself to get to that point of acceptance and, and realization, to let go of the, of the labels. And, and now that you know yourself, who are you? <laughs> I am authentically me. <laughs> Warts and all. I, I appreciate all the areas where I'm not good. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be all the roles that I am. Author, speaker, mother, wife. Mm. Yeah. Second principle is creativity. Yes. Talk to me about that as the second principle. Yeah. It could have been anything else. Yeah. But the second principle is there for a reason. Yeah, I think uh, creativity is, um, has some real magical properties. There are research studies that show creativity helps the brain relax. So in, in when you are diagnosed with a stress-induced illness, um, trying to find ways to be creative is of utmost importance. So I had to, and these days I, I do believe that people shy away from fun. You know, there's, life is so demanding that we don't actually give ourselves permission to have fun and to just make something just for the sheer joy of it. 
So I did indulge in a whole lot of methods of creativity just to yeah. try to heal and find my way through. Now, you know, there were a couple of incidents and, I, and, I, and I'm going to kind of just talk about it very quickly. There's a couple of instances, two weddings where you had to go still deal with the kids and all of that kind of stuff. And, and you also called Stuart out on it. Um, while, you know, all these things are happening, you are still having to deal, even though you're in a completely different part of the world, even yeah. the stress of just driving and navigating and all that kind yeah. of stuff. As opposed to uh, maybe a year later or two years later, you're going on a, on a, on a trip by yourself. For the first time, the uh, or the, the 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 first time you discover that little room, which used to be, I think, the baby's room. It was the seed room. That seed had room. Of, yeah. Yeah. Then you then you moved and you went. Well, yes. you were in one room and then f- discovered the seed room. Yes. And then called it the sanctuary. Yeah. What what is what is freedom? And I and I've got to be careful with the way I ask it because uh, parents can never really be free of their responsibility. Yeah. But what is the freedom of being able to go on that trip by yourself or have the sanctuary? What does that give you in the context of a hurly burly day daily operation of a family? Yeah, it creates great um, recovery time, I believe, to have your own section of the house or to own little room um, that you can use to mm. recover and to enjoy. So I, I had to be very strict with the kids because it is kind of a magical room for the kids. There's a lot of little drawers <laughs> with paints and crayons yeah. and cokies and all sorts of wonderful things in there. So they're very curious and they always want to yeah. come inside. But I've been very firm on that boundary because it is my space and it's critical for me to be able to heal and create there. But you're teaching them something too. Yes. That it's okay to claim yes. your space. Yes. And my oldest in the top of her bunk bed has also made what she calls her sanctuary where she reads and <laughs> has some downtime and, sure. and her crazy sister's not allowed yeah. <laughs> uh, creativity uh, uh, as a second part of dealing with stress as point i won't go in the others i want people to buy the book and read it but how how easy or difficult was it that for you and i think for a lot of people a lot of people think of creative people as something zany completely different mm, yeah but you're still a numbers person yes. you're still in a day-to-day yeah. and running the operation getting into the nuts and bolts of things how, how did you then contextualize creativity away from the idea that creative people are they color outside the lines and all that kind of stuff yeah there are definitely those perceptions that creative people are you know disorganized and uh, all over the place i think we are all creative to some degree or other and i think uncovering that sense of creativity inside ourselves is quite an important thing to do so i i still believe that i am a a practical and analytical logical person um, but i do love making things and i get i see that in other people too that that uh, label themselves as being very practical in the world you know doctors Mm. and lawyers and things but it's remarkable i I love to see the things that they make you know Mm. crochet blankets and decoupage and mosaic Mm. and the most incredible things people actually come up with in their spare time which is really impressive I hope this interview hasn't taken a lot of your energy, but <laughs> no. I, I want to ask you, um, where are you now physically, health-wise, mentally? Where are you? Yeah, I see myself as fully recovered. Um, I'm able to, I do uh, love yoga these days. I like to do the hot yoga, the kind of intense one. Is that the Bikram one? Yes, yeah, yeah. I think, because uh, I, I don't believe, ex- I still am struggling with exercise being easy. <laughs> okay. And so I love yo- a lot of yoga. I think there's a lot of mind-body connection there, which is valuable. I'm able to do that and then work quite a few hours in the day you know seven hours and then still fetch my kids do homework with them deal, cook a meal yeah. so i can i can function in a normal day like everybody else now but it did take several years to get there okay we've got a minute and a half i want to do a recap quickly um i'll shout out the name you can give me a two-liner in or out. where they are <laughs> where they are judy out out um, of my life completely you haven't spoken to in how long no uh three years and uh, that's the after the hammer attack yes hammer okay. incident over okay Clyde. Out of my life completely. Yeah. After I told him to never phone me again. Okay. Yeah. But he, he's, he's had some medical complication. Yes. He did have a stroke last year and I had a bit of a crisis wondering whether I should um, bring him back into my life, but I decided not to. Clyde and Judy still together? Yes. Um, will you and Clyde ever make peace? Possibly. I'd like to make peace, but I'm not sure I want him in my everyday life. Okay. Charles? I don't have any contact with him, but I don't wish him any harm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jake? Uh, Jake, I haven't had contact with. Uh, I, I do I believe I probably brought him quite a lot of suffering, so I regret that. But um, I'm also not, not in touch with him anymore. Okay. Uh, Brandon? 
Uh, yes, I see him. Yeah. Because he's your biological. He's you biological, brother. full brother. Yeah. And, yeah, and you yeah, guys have a great him. relationship. And yeah, we have a good relationship. I wouldn't say great, but we have ups and downs. And yeah, I see him quite often. Yeah. The stepbrother that you, Glenn. Glenn, yes, I see him regularly. Yeah, yeah. Because you at one point wanted Glenn to take over from you. Yes, but he's remained in the corporate space and he's doing an outstanding job. Okay, yeah. and finally, Stuart. Stuart, my husband, yeah, things are good. <laughs> yeah, no, I've kept him around. He's kind of useful sometimes. <laughs> He's kind of useful sometimes. Uh, Kathy Mann, thank you very much for spending the last 50 minutes with us. It's called Avoiding Burnout, the seven principles of self-preservation. Go and get it. I guarantee you, you're going to have a debate. Pass it on to your partner once you've read it. Don't, don't preempt the conversation. Let that person engage with the content first and then have a conversation, but have an honest conversation. Because there are, some couple, there are a couple of things here that I think couples will, will maybe see. And, and back me up if I say this. You're going to find out when you read this book and your partners with this book that there are spaces where we're living past each other. Yeah, yeah. And I do want people to have that honest conversation so that they, both lives become enriched when you talk honestly about what you need. Where is it available, Kathy? It's an av- available in uh, all good bookstores and online as well. So Amazon, iBooks, yeah. Okay, that's a wrap for the weekly. We'll see you next week. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za.